Maybe I should take a look at another interesting application of 3D in gaming. I'm totally not foreshadowing my next core video that I've been working on for the past two months. Past two months. <laughs> What's up, dude? And, uh, who the heck are you? I'm you, from a future where technology has progressed like how the 80s predicted. Huh, so you guys have, like, what, flying cars and hoverboards? Yeah, there's there's stuff like that. Yo, what? That's super cool. Have you tried any of them? What does it feel like? Oh, you need a license to operate both of those things. I, I don't have any experience. Oh. I got this super sick robotic AI companion, though. That's just Rob. Anyway, I'm here to give you a really rad video idea. You should totally take a look at Nintendo's first foray into the miracle of 3D gaming. What, the Virtual Boy? I covered that in 2018, what do you mean? Nah, it's this totally tubular thing I'm wearing on my head. Tell you what, since we're friends and all that... We just met. I'm gonna give you one to take a look at, free of charge. <laughs> Terms and conditions may apply. Stay cool, dude. This is the Famicom 3D system. I suppose the majority of you have only heard this once or never considering it was only released in Japan and was a massive flop. But it was indeed Nintendo's first attempt at 3D video games, long before the Virtual Boy became another massive flop. You know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, you try, 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 try again. The 3D system isn't really too complicated to set up at all, even though the diagram on the side of the box makes it look like a tutorial for Nintendo Switch voice chat. Inside the box you have the manual, an adapter that plugs into the system, and the glasses themselves. Or is it a visor? A headset? I'll go with headset. The adapter connects to the Famicom through the expansion port on the front, and you connect the headset to it using a headphone jack. This is just begging to have speakers plugged into it, I need to give it a try later. Putting on the headset is pretty straightforward. You can manually adjust the length of the strap and then you can just fit it over your head. There's also plenty of space for glasses as well, so no need to worry about them. Now while the 3DS uses a parallax barrier and the Virtual Boy just has two LED displays, the Famicom 3D system uses a pair of active shutters for its 3D effect, which means the TV screen will alternate between images for the left and right eye rapidly, which are filtered by the shutter so that each eye sees a different image, thus forming a three-dimensional image in your brain. This also means that the 3D system would only work on a CRT screen, similar to accessories like the Zapper. And that's it for the setup. While playing a compatible game, whether it's on a cartridge or a disc, you can toggle the 3D mode on and off using select, and the headset will respond accordingly. The quality of the 3D effect generally varies from game to game, which is why we're going to be taking a look at the games next. There are 7 known compatible games that supported the 3D system, and I have in my possession all of them. Yep, we are taking a look at the full library. This is kinda part of the reason why this video took more than half a year to make. Please share. First up, Attack Animal Gakuen, or Attack Animal Academy, developed by Pony Canyon. This is a shooter game that is definitely not inspired by Space Harrier at all. It involves a schoolgirl flying through an animal-infested sky to save her kidnapped friend. I mean, if a bunch of mad kangaroos, jetpack-wearing crocodiles, and Torterra held my friend hostage while I was visiting Japan and forced me to fly through the sky to save them, I'd understandably be mad too. Well, let's turn the 3D effect on. Wait, wait, hold on, before we go on any further, I want to connect some speakers to this and see what happens. I don't know what, I don't know what I expected. Of course, in 2D, you just see the image flicker back and forth. And this flickering can definitely lead to some ghosting issues when you look at it through the active shutters. But the 3D system does work at producing a feeling of depth as objects fly by your character. Actually, spoiler alert, but we'll be seeing a lot of these games play from this sort of rear view perspective where you're moving into the screen. Probably because that's the only way you can get cool 3D visuals with the Famicom's technology. There are definitely more interesting applications of 3D than this, but those can wait. Oh, they can wait. I think that putting a basic tile pattern on the floor to give the illusion of scrolling is a bit too basic though. 
I get the technical limitations and all, but the lack of smoothness on the scrolling and enemy movements just make it look a lot more jittery in 3D. The game's also pretty challenging. The enemies are fast and you can only shoot two bullets at a time. You also start with just three lives, which can only be replenished by reaching a certain score. I find that moving in a circle does help avoid most attacks, similar to Kid Icarus Uprising. On occasion, a bunch of statues will scroll across the floor. I thought they were enemies at first, but they're actually power-ups, allowing you to have more bullets on screen and increased movement speed. Not a big fan of the speed boost though, it just makes you easier to get hit from what I've seen. If things get a bit too fast for your taste though, you can apparently advance frame by frame by pressing select while the game is paused. Weird. In general though, it's a basic space harrier clone with animals instead of aliens. But considering their designs, you could pretty much say that they're aliens. Oh god, it's a koala with a gun! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. These are completely normal animal skeleton with sunglasses is my favorite. Alright, let's move on to the next game. Next up we have Cosmic Epsilon by Asmic, another rare shooter, this time sci-fi themed. While people have also compared it to Space Harrier, this makes a lot of considerable improvements over Attack Animal Academy. Since this game doesn't even have its own Wikipedia page, I'll just guess the game's plot from its intro. It's the year 20XX, a bunch of aliens are invading Earth, yada yada yada, you play as this mech guy who is going to destroy them. Right off the bat, this presentation is definitely a significant improvement over Animal Academy. First of all, there's actual unique patterns on the floor now. The scrolling is way smoother too, which makes the 3D effect look a lot better. Mech guy over here also has more weapons at his disposal. You fire from these two spheres like the orbitars in Kid Icarus with the B button, and their attacks can even be charged for a stronger attack. You also have a limited supply of homing missiles. This doesn't mean the game is a walk in the park though. Luckily, if you're like me and don't have the time to deal with NES era difficulty, the developers were actually kind enough to include cheat codes in the game. If you press up A, right B, down A, left B, up and select at the title screen, you get permanent invincibility. You cheated not only the game, but yourself. You didn't grow, you didn't improve. You took a shortcut, you used a hollow, fetching with Swiss sand, and nothing else did different. Also, I just wanted to mention that if you put in the Konami code on the title screen, it just tells you, I am not Konani. Nice typo there. I guess it's trying to distinguish itself from Cosmic Wars, which is a similarly named game from Konami. Anyway, this is definitely a great looking shooter for Famicom standards despite its difficulty. There's a wide variety of pretty set pieces both on land and in space, and I love how the camera angle slightly tilts based on Meg Dude's position to enhance the feeling of death. It is pretty long though, even with the invincibility code it took me nearly an hour to reach the end of the game. Still though, it's one of the more noteworthy titles on the system. If you come across it, do check it out, but do keep in mind that this game was a Japan exclusive release. Next, we have our first Famicom Disk System game that uses the 3D system, Falchion. I guess this is now Konani. Right off the bat, you can choose to start the game in 3D mode as well, but you can still toggle it on and off during the game with select. Alright, let's hop in and fight some- oh, alright, Disk System. Alright, here we go. This is a pretty fast-paced space shooter where you control the Falchion ship, I'm guessing? As you mow down hordes of alien ships with blasters and homing missiles, set to the vast darkness of the Milky Way. What differentiates this from Cosmic Epsilon are the variations in the enemy patterns. In that game, the enemies are just kinda slowly approaching while also shooting at you. But in Falchion, they just try to ram into you like, whoa, 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 slow down there, buddy. You got ships constantly moving in and out of the screen in different patterns trying to slam you out of existence, which actually makes for a really great 3D effect despite the simpler background. While the homing missiles can help you out a bit and they're replenished at a decent pace, trying to stockpile on them can be a pretty big risk, since once you lose a life, they're all gone. Once you get accustomed to the chaos though, you do pick up a neat little pace. For the first boss that constantly shoots at you, you just go around in circles and shoot at it for like a minute or two. There are other kinds of scenery in the game in addition to Windows 95 screensaver, but they all kinda suffer from the same problem the Attack Animal Academy has, with a kinda stuttery scrolling speed, like look at these trees, you can barely tell that they're scrolling. 
Other than that though, it's a solid game. It's tough, but getting a game over only means starting the stage over instead of the whole game. So at least the developers had some semblance of mercy. Just remember to actually choose the continue option before the game automatically boots you to the title screen in like 2 seconds. I mean, if it doesn't want me to continue that badly, I guess I'll just move on to the next game. Well, thank Virtual Boy, we finally have a game that isn't a shoot-'em-up. Famicom Grand Prix 2 3D Hot Rally. It's actually the first Nintendo project that Shigeru Miyamoto and the late Satoru Iwata worked together on. And like the title suggests, it's a sequel to the first Famicom Grand Prix game. I figure I should talk a little about that one too. The first installment, not to be confused with another Nintendo title called F1 Race, is a top-down racer, with no 3D functionality whatsoever. It's also the first racing game starring Mario, and a decent one at that once you get used to the steering controls. 3D Hot Rally, on the other hand, is the real deal. You have three cars to choose from, the Kato... This car, that car, and the monster, each with different stats. You then pick from a whopping three courses and hop right into racing. Oh, right. Oh, come on. There we go. Once the game's done loading, you get to choose where in the course to set your repair point in case your vehicle suffers from too much damage during the ride. Each course features tons of branching paths, but that also means you have to make sure you don't take a wrong turn and miss the repair point that you've set yourself. And we're off! This looks pretty much like your standard NES racing game, but something just looks a little... off. Like, why do those street lamps have eyes? And the bushes have evil grins? Is this supposed to be the Mario universe where everything in nature inexplicably has facial features? I mean, I get that, but like, these things just look like... I think I'm being spied on. I, I feel uncomfortable. Someone please help me. <clears throat> anyway, what's cool about this game compared to other racers, besides from the decent 3D effect that's enhanced by the scrolling scenery, is the addition of verticality to the courses. It might look a bit subtle, but occasionally you go up and down slopes that's conveyed pretty well by the dynamically shifting height of the track and background. And there's even bumps that can give your car some brief airtime if you go fast enough. I don't think I've ever seen this pulled off in all the other NES era racing titles, at least those from Nintendo, so that's mighty impressive. You know what's even more impressive? Along the track, you might see these exclamation marks. You collect them to fill up this meter on the hub, and once it's filled up, you can access a fifth gear option that lets you go- ah! Okay, that was way too fast, you just end up crashing into everything. Which costs you precious time because not being able to reach the next checkpoint in the designated time causes this number here to go down. And once it hits zero, it's game over. Still, this is a fairly interesting take on the racing genre, with varied mechanics and a nice 3D effect to go along with it. Going off on a small tangent here, but both 3D Hot Rally and its prequel came in blue floppy disks with shutters on top. Players could save their high scores on these special discs, and bring them to game stores around Japan to upload their scores to Nintendo and participate in the nationwide leaderboard with prizes. So technically, this is one of Nintendo's first forays into some form of online gaming, in the late 80s. That is pretty dang mind-blowing. 3D Hot Rally was also briefly pitched for a Western release, but Nintendo of America criticized the cute and uncool look of the vehicles. This criticism would actually go on to inspire the art style of F-Zero. Guess this game did a lot more than we give it credit for. You know you did good when your game gets a remix in Smash Brothers. Now this next game here is Fuun Shaolin Ken Anko- Okay, I'm gonna stop before I butcher the Japanese pronunciation any further. But this is the second game in the series starring a young martial arts master in China. The game itself is a 2D fighting game with a standard side view. I can't really tell you about the plot or the opponents you fight because I can't read Japanese. But what I do know is that the game has an interesting branching path system where you can choose what opponents to fight next in the story. Anyway, we are taking a look at this game since it does support the 3D system, so let's see what it looks like. Wait, what? Okay, so it turns out unlike every other game we're looking at in this video, you don't toggle the 3D on and off with the select button. The game doesn't even advertise 3D support on the cover compared to the other disc games, but it is there. Listed in the manual, you can turn 3D mode on by holding A while starting the game. And uh, yup, it's in 3D alright. It's literally just separating the flat sprite layer from the flat background layer, so it really isn't doing much. And I can see why this feature wasn't advertised as heavily. 
Anyway, that's about it. The actual game isn't that much to write home about from what I've tried. You punch with A, kick with B, and just sort of mash them until you win or lose. I'm not sure if I can even jump, which is what my opponents keep doing. Maybe I'm just not good at these games. Let's just move on. Next up we have Highway Star, but it's better known over in the west as Rat Racer, one of the first racing games for the NES. Did you know this game was made by Square? Yep, Square Enix Square. Before they merged with Enix and before they figured out their whole RPG shtick with Final Fantasy. At that time, they were experimenting with making a bunch of stereoscopic 3D games, and Rad Racer was one of them. If you're familiar with the game, you might know that you could play it with the Power Glove, but also in the West, it shipped with a pair of Analyph 3D glasses that can be used with the in-game 3D mode. In Japan, however, months before it made its way to the NES, it actually supported the Famicom 3D system instead. And playing with that looks way cooler than wearing a flimsy pair of red and blue glasses, so take that, Americans. As for the game itself, it's a pretty standard racing game, where you complete a course and must race to each checkpoint on time. I feel that 3D Hot Rally is a bit more unique in this aspect, but Rat Racer is still one of the better NES racing games with much more solid controls in my opinion. Actually, the 3D system adapter has a pass-through in the front for other accessories, so you could use both the 3D system and the power glove on it and surpass Lucas Barton. Hey, can I borrow like that power glove you got there? Well, we're finally at the last game in the Famicom 3D system lineup. But before we do that, we actually need to look at one additional game. The 3D Battles of World Runner. This is another one of Square's experiments with 3D gaming. Like Rat Racer, it was released in the West with Analyph 3D glasses, but it was also released on the disc system in Japan as Operation Jump Out, also with Analyph 3D glasses. Yes, this game didn't actually support the 3D system, but it did get a sequel that supported it, so we might as well take a look at this one first. Rather than being a typical shoot 'em up, in this game you play as Jack, who just runs along the ground. You dodge obstacles by moving left and right, and you can control your speed and jump over gaps with a very adjustable jump height depending on your button press. Occasionally, you can grab onto a balloon along the course to go to a bonus area for more collectibles. I guess you can say that this is a pretty interesting early take on the endless runner genre. Well, it isn't exactly endless. At the end of each world, you've faced off against a boss and the game turns into a traditional shoot 'em up. The first boss isn't even that hard, it just moves back and forth while waiting for you to shoot at it. But yeah, this is a fun game and can get a little tough since you have to juggle both your speed and movement to avoid doing things like jumping right into a pit. I do like how if you pause the game while on the ground, Jax just sits down and takes a little break. Well, you just sit there and get some rest while we look at the sequel, which is known as JJ and is the one that actually supports the Famicom 3D system. Now, this essentially plays the same as the previous game, but takes the Lost Levels approach to sequel design and basically picks its difficulty up right after the end of the first game. So in the first level, you're already going really fast and have no way to change your speed at all. Like, look at this! This requires your constant attention and reflexes. Also, Jack looks like Solid Snake in this game for some reason. This is also the part where I learned that bonking into these solid pillars don't kill you, but also reward you with power-ups that grant you things like shield power-ups and invincibility. Don't grab the ice though, the ice kill you. This is the Lost Levels approach, alright? The 3D effect in this game is definitely a lot better than in the first game, since the game no longer turns into a pile of ugly colors when you do so. And you also don't have to, you know, look at it through tinted glasses. The 3D might prove useful in some of the boss fights too. Overall, this game is a really challenging but cathartic game to play through. Everything just happens super fast. In the later worlds, you even get enemies that try to block your path, and even trampolines that you have to land on with perfect positioning to jump across large gaps. Fortunately, you can continue from the beginning of your current world Mario 1 style if you get a game over, so in the end it isn't too frustrating. I say give these two games a try if you have the chance. They were released at a time when Square was hitting a decline with multiple commercial failures, and JJ would be the last Square game released before they went on to create Final Fantasy. So this is definitely an interesting piece of Square history. And that's also it for this interesting piece of Nintendo history. 7 games is definitely a small number for a full-on system accessory to support, but I can see why the Famicom 3D system didn't catch on. The tech behind it is definitely impressive for the 80s, and active shutter technology would still be used later on for things like 3D TVs. But at the time, it was a bit too clunky to be useful, with flickering and stuttering issues aplenty. 
when it worked, it was pretty dang cool, but there was also little variety in the games made for it outside of racing slash shooting game where a character moves into the screen. So most customers didn't really think the whole thing was worth it for an optional 3D function. Of course, as technology advanced, games on the 3DS and even the Virtual Boy showed that there are definitely great applications of 3D in game design. But the Famicom 3D system was a decent first step, and the majority of games who support it definitely benefited from it. Yo, so what did you think about it? Well, yeah, honestly, it wasn't too bad. For Nintendo's first shot at 3D gaming, it wasn't too bad of an attempt. So what, uh, you did mention something about terms and conditions when you first gave me this thing, right? Oh yeah, by accepting that, you also agreed to reveal any other random Famicom accessory I throw your way at the future, so I'm definitely looking forward to that Rob the Robot core video. <sighs> okay, look, this just this video took me long enough to make already. I'll take a look at Rob and other stuff in the future, okay? Just, like, give me some time. Ah, alright. You know, it's like paying your debt in Animal Crossing. Uh, what? There's no deadline, but I'll be waiting. Well, um, by the way, did you know? The product code for the Famicom 3D system on the box? It's 3DS. Talk about foresight, am I right?